You know, Jesus came to give us something that money could not give us. Eternal life that Jesus gave to us, the most popular place in the scripture, is John chapter 3, verse 16. And John chapter 3, verse 16 would say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And another way to put that is, you shall have eternal life. When you place your faith in Jesus and what he has done for you, in the spirit, automatically, what happens to you is that you receive eternal life. Now, your eyes might not change. Your face might not change. Your hair might not change, right? Let, let's say you're not born again, you came here today, and then you receive Jesus today. You go back home, you're still the you, right? People still, it's still Yinka, it's still Esther, it's still everybody here. But you know something happens on your inside when you give your life to Christ. There's something that happens on your inside when you receive eternal life. And that's what Jesus came to give us. You see that thing? There is no amount of money in your account that can give you eternal life. Eternal life is priceless. It's not what you can buy or else only the rich will get saved. <laughs> it's not something you can achieve or else only some of us that like to strive, strive, my get it. It's not something that it's in a particular country or else there will be war because every country will want to have eternal life in their own country. This gift called eternal life is available to every single person that is ready to receive what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And that is what the gospel is all about. That is what the good news is all about. That no matter who you are, no matter where you're coming from, no matter what you have done, Jesus paid for all of your sins. And then you don't have to pay for the same sins. So what you have to do is to put your faith in that person that paid for your sins, that took your place on the cross, so that in that moment, you now take his place at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, his hands were stretched and he screamed, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? And why did Jesus scream? Because as at that moment, Jesus was carrying your sins. He was carrying my sins. He was carrying the sins of the whole world. Jesus did not die for Christians. He died for the world. <laughs> right? The Christians, so to say, the believers, are the set of people that have received the gift of God which is made available through Jesus. But Jesus died for the prostitute as well. Jesus died for the terrorist. Jesus died for the whole world. And this gift of salvation is made available that if you are getting born again today, you are pronounced righteous in the sight of God. So this gift called eternal life, you know, so many people are trying to look for this thing. At times people think, they will find fulfillment in a job. But no matter the job you're doing today, you can't get fulfillment from a job. If you think you have, what, when you retire, what happens to your life? <laughs> right? If you think your job is where your fulfillment is coming from, so what happens when you retire? What happens if they lay you off? So fulfillment doesn't come from the job. It doesn't come from money. There are some things, actually a lot of things, money cannot buy. Lots of things. Money can buy loyalty, can buy committed people, friends. You need real friends around you. You can buy them. <laughs> but the Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. Jesus is that guy that you don't have to perform for him to like you. When it comes to your other friends, you got to be good to them. You wish them happy birthday on, the, on their birthday, then they wish you happy birthday on your birthday. If you don't wish them happy birthday on that birthday, they won't wish you happy birthday on your birthday. You see, with man, you got to hang their like, their love, their approval. If you are good to me, I feel obligated to be good to you. And that's how the world system operates. You're good to me, I'm good to you. You don't care for me, I don't really care for you. That's how the world system operates. But with Jesus, he loves you the way you are. You don't have to perform. You don't have to earn it. 
He loves you because he is love. And that is awesome. You don't have to seek for Jesus' approval. Jesus is the one chasing you with his love. Remember the story in the book of Luke chapter 15? The Bible speaks about the parable of the lost son, so to say. And this guy left his father. So he told his dad, he said, Dad, give me all my inheritance. Because the dad seems to be living longer than he's supposed to be. <laughs> Maybe the dad attends crossover church. <laughs> so the, the dad was not dying anymore. But the, the, the dad was so rich, and the guy knew that he deserved some part of the dad's property. But they can't give him except the dad died. That's the normal thing. Except the person passed away, then you, you check the will. But this guy knows he has a lot of properties, but he can't access them yet. So he went to meet the dad. He said, Daddy, just give me all my inheritance now, and I will leave. Because technically, the moment he gets that inheritance, it's as if the dad is there. Technically, you've gotten everything you deserve. This guy left with all the properties. The father was not annoyed because Jesus was trying to make us understand the image of our loving father, heavenly father. And then the son left with the property and he wasted everything. And then he was so poor to the point whereby he was tempted to be eating the same food given to pigs. And then he said, you know what? I'm just going to go back home. I have nothing to lose. But you remember that the servant of the dad, even the servant, not sons, servant, they have food to eat and they have extra. So he said to himself, I am going to go back home and tell my dad to make me one of his servants. Because as at that time, technically, he felt as if he's no longer his son. But at least make me a servant. Why? So that I can also have food to eat and have extra left. But you know the beautiful thing? The Bible says when the son was approaching the house, the father saw him from afar. Now, this is normal logic. Except you're expecting somebody. <laughs> you can't be waiting for them. Except you're expecting somebody. Even if somebody who appears to be that person appears from afar, you won't conclude it's that person automatically. You understand what I mean? The guy left on a bad note. So I don't think the father should automatically say it's him. No. The father must have been waiting for him. And that's what the love of God is all about. God's love flowing in your direction is not just for your good days. God loves you on your ugly days. And we need to preach that kind of God. God is not an angry God. God is not mad at you. You know, I showed us one time here in Isaiah chapter 54. The Bible literally says in English language, God said, I swear, I will never be angry with you. You'll be amazed, that's in the Bible. Because the world needs to know this kind of God. The world is concluding that maybe God is angry with them, so they don't want to come to church. It's the other way around. Actually, God is not mad at you. And the next question should be, why would you say God is not angry with me? Do you know what I've done? And my answer would be, God knew everything you are going to do. And he carried the punishment of everything you will ever do and put it on the body of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So that he doesn't judge you today when you believe in Jesus. Because he judged Jesus for your sake. And that is the gospel. What we deserved was judgment. But God put that judgment on his son. So that today we can say surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Glory to God. Are, are we still here? Are we still here? Glory to God. And that's the good news of Christ. Now that I'm already preaching, I'll just as well just preach. <laughs> and then we'll take offerings after what is that okay? Okay. Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bible, open it. If you don't, just look at the screen. Romans chapter 1. It, 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 since November 6th, that's three months now, we've been checking the series, The Good News of Christ. And I've been laying emphasis on this. The good news of Christ. Romans chapter 1 from verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I am not ashamed. And with all humility, I want to say this to everybody here, everybody online, and everybody who listen to this, the day you fully understand the gospel, the day you fully understand it, 
you can't help it. You want to preach it. If you tell people, let's go and preach the gospel, let's go for evangelism, and they say, no, I'm shy, I don't want to go, it's because they don't fully understand the gospel. The moment, that second when you understand the gospel, you will stop being ashamed of the gospel. But most times, if we don't know what the gospel is, we don't even want to go preach it in the first place. But Paul was writing here to the Romans church and he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know why? Because when the gospel of Christ is being preached, the Bible says the power of God unto salvation is made available. In fact, in other words, the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. So let's say I, I need God's power in any area of my life. What should I do? I just have to expose that area of my life to the gospel. Again, my generation, sadly, we want to look for every other thing and we are trying to get it outside Jesus. The truth of the matter is everything we need is wrapped up in Christ. Forgiveness of sins is wrapped up in Christ. If you see anybody today who says, well, I'm finding it hard to forgive myself, the person still doesn't understand the gospel yet. Because when we expose God's people to the gospel of Christ, and we tell them the good things that happen because of what Jesus has done, automatically, he begins to reflect in their lives. For example, if you find it, let's say there's somebody who has offended you right now, or someone really did something bad to you, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, and you're really hot. The moment we expose that area of your life to the gospel, you find out that forgiving the person becomes more easy. If you want to break free from any habit, you got to be exposed to the gospel. Because the Bible says the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation in that context is encompassing. It is the power of God unto transformation. It is the power of God unto healing. I'm going to show us later today a couple of places whereby Jesus forgave the sin of somebody and then he healed the person. And I will show you a couple of verses and I will possibly continue on Wednesday. The, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus is not just, well, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Bye-bye. Now I got to make money. Now I got to take care of my family. Now I got to, I got to go to the doctor to heal me. Now I got to, no. You don't leave Jesus and try to start sorting your life on your, on your own. You see, what Jesus wants to do in your life when you receive him is that he wants to help you. You know, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit your helper. That's what the Bible calls the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. I will send you a helper. So Jesus wants to be in your life and he wants to help you. No matter what season you are right now, Jesus wants to help you. But at times, if we don't understand this gospel, we try to figure out things on our own. And when we are tired, when we get discouraged, when we are anxious, when we are worried, it's because we are not exposing that area of our lives to the gospel. And this is what I've been preaching in the past three months. We'll just take it a step further from here. Is that okay? Give us the next slide. Thank you, Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation. This is NLT back and it says, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It's good news. You know what good news is? Good news. <laughs> it has to be good. And what is good about what Jesus has done? Give us the next verse. Romans 4.25. Two things you should know if you are born again. Jesus died and God raised him from the dead. But let me show you. Why did he die? The Bible says he was handed over to die. Why? Because of our sins. And the Bible says he was raised to life to make us right with God. 
So the death of Jesus brought about your forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of Jesus brought about your right standing with God. If you're born again, you must understand this. If you don't understand this simple Romans 4.25, it will affect your whole relationship with God. So over the month, over the weeks, we've been repeating this thing over and over. That you are forgiven today. Why? Because of the death of Jesus. If you don't put the reality of you being forgiven on the fact that Jesus died, no matter how you even pray to God, you will never feel as if you are completely forgiven. You know, at times when people do something wrong, they want to do something right to try and make up for the wrong thing they've done. <laughs> right? But you know, there's only one atonement as far as God is concerned, and it's the one Jesus did on your behalf. When you receive God's forgiveness to you, then it becomes easy to forgive yourself. It becomes easy to forgive your family. I don't know who must have offended you in the past many years, or I don't know where you're coming from, but I, I want you to be exposed to the fact that God forgave your sins through the death of Jesus. And the more you receive this in your heart, you find it easy to forgive whoever must have offended you, hurt you in the past many years, and you're not letting go. The Bible says it was handed over to die because of our sins. We don't deserve this, but yet God decided it because he loves us. And the Bible says he was raised to life to make us right with God. Right standing with God is not what you can achieve by your works. You know, I'm so glad you're in church today, but you know, this is not why you have the right standing with God. It is not your works or your religious activity that earn you right standing with God. You have a right standing with God today because... Of the resurrection of Jesus. So your right standing with God is not attached to your works, it is attached to the finished works of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let God's people say, Amen. So that's what Romans chapter 4, verse 5 is saying. Glory to God. Now, can we have the next slide? And then to take it further step forward, 2 Corinthians 5 21 lays emphasis on the same thing. The Bible says, For God made him who knew no sin. Jesus died for the sins of the world, but Jesus never committed a sin. This is to let, him, let us know how much he loves us. We committed a sin. Jesus never committed a sin. Jesus took our place as the sinner, and then today we are taking his place. When we get born again, we can say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And this, this, this is a powerful truth. And I've showed us over and over. Why do we lay emphasis on the fact that you are righteous? And it's all because of what Jesus has done. The reason is because, number one, religion preaches the exact opposite. Today, religion will tell you that God accepts you according to the measure of what you do for him. That God possibly loves you according to your goodness, as long as you come to church, as long as you pay your tithes, as long as you... But all of those things a byproduct. God loves you today. He accepts you today because God is love. It is independent of you. When God was sending Jesus to die for the whole world, none of us deserved it. None of us earned it. God gave us Jesus because God is a gracious God. So the Bible says God made him who never committed a sin, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you're born again, say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We got to understand this thing. You see, if you don't understand this thing, it even affects your prayer life. You know, it takes somebody who knows I have a right standing with God to pray to God about some major things in your life. You, you, you got to know you have a right standing with God. Because if you don't know you have a right standing with God, even when you go through situations, you might conclude that God is the one even punishing you. There are people like that. I've, I've seen people like that who just concluded that this is going on in their life because God is punishing them. It shows that these people don't understand the gospel. Again, if God wants to punish you, then he will not punish Jesus for your sake. 
But God is not the one punishing you. That's why he allowed Jesus to be punished on the cross. That's, that's the normal logic. If God wants to deal with me, then why did he deal with Jesus on the cross? Right? But God wants to save you from that situation. So you got to know that you have the right standing with God. So let's say there's something you're trusting God for right now. You can just say, Lord Jesus, because I have the right standing with God, and it's not based on me. It's based on what you have done. I pray for this, and I pray for this in Jesus' name. That is how, that's what it means to pray a prayer of faith. You know you have a right standing with God no matter what it is. If you feel a pain in your body, you say, Father Lord, because I have a right standing with you, I command this faith to get out in Jesus' name because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It builds your faith because you have a right standing with God. You can't be tormented because you have a right standing with God. So this is one of the weapons a believer we have. You know, just a quick digression. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, the Bible says, put on the whole hammer of God. How many of you know that scripture? Put on the whole hammer of God. And if you take it a step further, it says, so that you may be able to withstand the fiery dart of the wicked. And then when he started talking about those hammer, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And if I want to show you a picture, so it's just, just going to sound like you guard your, your chest. Like your, it's like a breastplate of righteousness. And why is that important? What does it mean by breastplate of righteousness? And he's trying to tell you that as a believer in, in, in summary, that your heart needs to be guided with the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? You see, the enemy always wants you to doubt your right standing with God. Always. Always. In fact, one of the major assignments of the enemy is to make, if you check the scripture, he wants people to doubt their spot in the heart of God. It's like, imagine if you're married now and somebody's always coming to meet your partner and say, are you sure your partner really, really loves you? <laughs> right? It's subtle, but the devil wants you to doubt your partner's love for you. And if you bring it to the context of what I'm trying to say, the devil wants you to doubt God's love for you. The devil wants you to feel as if you see, if, if, if you think God is going to love you, you just did this, you just got angry, you just did that, you just... So he's going to point you to your weakness or some of the things you've done wrong and make you feel as if God is not really going to answer you today. But if you understand, again, that your right standing with God is based on what Jesus has done and not what you have done, you're still going to pray to God. So let's say I say everybody just pray to God right now. If there's anything bothering your mind. And then the enemy is making people as if, are you sure God is going to answer you? You're going to say, yes, he's going to answer me because I am righteous in the sight of God based on what Jesus has done, not based on what I have done. So our faith must always be in Jesus and what he has done for us. Amen. Okay, let's take it a step further. Let's just keep taking this step further. And Romans chapter 5 now say, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith. One more time, if you're here, these are truths I want you to live, live with. If you're here and you're born again, say, I have been made right in the sight of God. And it is by faith in Christ Jesus. You, you got to understand this truth. The Bible says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace. This thing called peace, the world is desperately looking for this thing called peace. The world is trying to ignore Jesus, but they want peace. It's not possible because Jesus himself is our peace. If you, the Bible says, you, since you have been justified by faith, then you have peace. Because an average person out there in the world doesn't have peace in their heart when it comes to God. Because they always feel as if God is angry with them. God is mad at them. So that's why we need to preach the good news. That God is not angry with them. Because Jesus took all the judgment, punishment they deserve. So that today when they get born again, God just wants to love them for the rest of their life. So we have peace. Say I have peace with God. And it is because of what Jesus has done. So people are looking for this thing called peace. And you don't get peace when you focus on what you are doing for God. You, you find this peace when you focus on what Jesus has done on your behalf. Peace that surpasses human understanding. 
Glory to God. Are, you, are, you, are we all understanding this thing? Are, are we getting what I've been preaching? Okay. So let me show you a story. Let me show you a story. Give me the next two slides. There's a story I want to show us in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, Jesus was preaching here. And then the Bible says, now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of the, every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal. You know, I could preach on this all day, but I'm not going to preach on this all day. Jesus was teaching, and I strongly want to believe he was preaching good news. And while he was teaching, the Bible recorded, and this is very powerful, while he was teaching, the power of God was present to heal. And I, I've said this over and over, and I'm going to repeat it over and over. Jesus came to redeem us. But you know, if forgiveness of sins is the only thing Jesus came to give to us, that is priceless. Because no man can receive forgiveness of sins except by putting faith in what Jesus has done. But you know, apart from forgiveness of sins, Jesus also made provision available for your healing. If you give us the next slide, the, the previous slide, Psalm 103, this is a very popular place in the scripture, the previous slide. The Bible says, he who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. This is, this, this is very important. And I want to preach this for the rest of my life. May God's people understand that the same way Jesus forgave your sin, at the same level, is the same way he took your infirmity. Jesus did not just die for your sin and say, you know what, take care of your health. If you're not feeling too fine, just anything the doctor says. Jesus did not say that. The Bible says, he who forgives all. Now, context, not my words, right? That is A double L, right? So if I say all of your sins are forgiven, do you understand what that means, right? Now, I, I, I personally feel as if the church is beginning to understand that first part to an extent. All our sins are forgiven. But you know what? And heals, did you see the same word all there? All your diseases. And I said this here last week. So that means if a doctor tells me, oh, I have a particular medical condition, I'm going to tell the doctor, um, I respect your, re your report, your result, but can you do another test? And if the doctor asks why, I'm going to say because Jesus healed all my diseases. So I don't think I'm going to have what you just told me I have. We, we have to run another test. Because Jesus. And you know, over and over, I always ask this $1 billion question. Let us assume that Jesus said something. Your doctor said something. Who do you think, if, if there's one of them that is going to be wrong, who do you think is going to be? The, the doctor, right? C could Jesus be wrong? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking honest questions. It, could Jesus be wrong? So if Jesus says something, if a doctor says something, who do you think would be right? Who do you think would be wrong? Is it because I don't believe? No, no. I, I'm not saying doctors are not doing their job. This is what I'm trying to make you understand. You see, as a believer, you have two realities. Technically, you have one reality. Your, but your main reality is what we call in Christ Jesus. That simply means if I'm right now starting my day, if I realize that I'm, I'm not sensing the joy of the Lord in my heart, I know that's not who I am. Because I know I'm always supposed to be joyous. It's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. So you know what I do? I just pray in tongues. I just say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I have eternal life on my inside. I can't do this for two minutes without sensing supernatural joy on my inside. It's not possible. So what am I trying to say? Now, I, could, I have two options. When life throws challenges at you, you always have two options as a believer. You can either embrace it and say, there's nothing I can do. It's okay. I'll just live with this. Or you can say, you know, what does the word of God say about this area of my life? And I'm trying to tell you today that you have what we call reality in Christ. And one of that reality is that your sins are forgiven and Jesus heals your diseases. Sometimes ago, 
few years ago, though, I was I was sleeping, <laughs> and then I got a call, and then there was more like um, a sister from Toronto who called, and then she was about to give birth, and the doctor gave a report about well she might not have the baby, something is happening, she has low blood, blah blah blah. Again, it's a diagnosis. I have no issues with that. But what I always say, again, if you are born again, it's either you either embrace what they said and you live by whatever happened, or you come back to the world. So when they, when they called me, I was, I'm like, you know what, I'm just waking up. But for a start, you can't have what the doctor said you just have. That was the first thing I told the person. You can't have it. Let's say, but the doctor, well, you got to believe somebody. Jesus said something. <laughs> the doctor said something. Except you're not born again. You see, if you're not born again, I will understand. I will understand. And I say, I, I've preached this to people. I say, even this, when somebody says, oh, I have flu, it's natural. If you have sense flu in your body, you say, Lord Jesus, because you heal all my diseases, now I speak to this flu to get out in Jesus' name. And I, I want to preach this over and over because I want us to take our rightful place as believers. If I sense any pain in my body, just like every other person does, I don't say, well, it's okay. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't, I don't do that. I have my reality, the word of God. And I understand Jesus took my pain. I know that the body of Jesus was broken so that my body can be put together. So I'm not just going to sit down. No, I don't do that. I speak to the pain. Get out of this body because my body is the temple of God in Jesus' name. And then a few hours after, if I still feel the same pain, I'm still going to pray the same prayer. I said, Lord, I speak to this pain. Get out of my body in Jesus' name. Because my body is the temple of God. The temple of God doesn't house pain. It doesn't. And the Bible says this. I, I, I really wish this was my words, but these were not my words. This, were, this is the scripture. He healed my diseases. So if you have flu tomorrow, don't say it's okay, it's normal, it's regular. It's not normal, it's not regular because you are born again. And flu was not part of the thing Jesus gave to you on the cross. So we are not going to entertain anything that is not of God in your body. That's why I'm exposing us to the good news of Christ that he also took care of your diseases. So let me go back to the story I was reading to you. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. So Jesus was teaching, and just to let you know how much God cares about your health, the Bible says the power of God was present to heal. If you have any pain and you're here, the power of God is present to heal it. And you're going to see supernatural strength on your inside. You're just going to feel strong, feel alive. Because it's by the Spirit of God. The Bible says the power of God was present to heal them. Then behold, men who brought, or men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find out they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before, that should be them, before Jesus, or before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, everybody keep this somewhere in your mind. The first word Jesus said is, your sins are forgiven. Go back to Psalm 103, two slides before. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, he who forgives all your... So keep that somewhere in your mind. The man came for something else. The man didn't come to be forgiven of his sins. He came to be healed. But Jesus was saying, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. And then let's go back to the story. Let me show you what happened next. And then the Bible says, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Everybody say, God forgives sins. And God, God is extending that forgiveness to everybody who is going to put their faith in Jesus Christ today. And the Bible says in the next verse, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your heart? The next one. Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, 
or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take your bed, and go to your house. Next slide. Immediately he rose up before them. He took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. And they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen straight things today. Go back to Psalm 103, verse 3. And I'm going to wrap up on this. I'm just going to wrap up now. So Psalm 103, verse 3 says, He forgives your sins and heals your diseases. And we saw this in Luke chapter 5. The man came to be healed, and Jesus first had to make the man understand, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And I want to say this over and over. Jesus forgives all your sins. The moment you get born again, sin is no longer a barrier between you and God because Jesus nailed all your sins to the cross. And then by the same token, Jesus took all your sins. That's the same way he took all your diseases on himself. You see all the sufferings of Jesus, all the pain he went through, all the beatings he took, it took them for you and for me. So that no pain is permitted in your body today. Jesus took it. He took it all. And that is the good news. Does, does that sound good to you? I think it sounds good to me. Glory to God. Can, can we all rise to our feet? Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If, if you can, can we rise to our feet? I'm done preaching. I just wanted to pray. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you because there's nothing more beautiful than being exposed to the gospel of Christ. The Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto healing. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody who is watching this online or who watches what this in the future or who is even here, and there's any form of pain in your body, any form of discomfort in your body, I release the power of God to heal you right now from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. And if there's anybody right now who is trusting you for emotional healing, I release the power of God right now into your emotions, and I, I declare that all you will sense in your heart going forward is the peace of God that surpasses human understanding, that comes through what Jesus has done for us. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' beautiful name, I will pray. And let God's people say, Amen.